and good evening. Good, good evening to everyone tonight and welcome to a very special, and I mean very special, Indigo Worship Live show tonight here in our quarantine studios. Yes, we are still in quarantine one year into quarantine, but hopefully within, an, we hope soon, I don't know when, but soon we will be back in our regular studios. But for now, everyone, I want everybody to be safe and well, as well as my guest. And um, I'm, I'm so excited for tonight's show. I know I say that every time, but really particularly tonight I am because I'm so honored to be able to have a wonderful conversation with the one and only Maestro Nerva Altino tonight. And um, you are going to be in for an amazing, amazing treat as we talk about his brand new book. So as usual, I always say, take the opportunity to like this page. If you like shows like this here on, on the Facebook Live, on Indigo Worship Facebook page, as well as you can follow us on Instagram at official Indigo Worship. And does uh, for some of the announcements I wanna make ahead of time, because I really don't wanna interrupt our interview tonight with um, Maestro Altino. We have a music conference that will be taking place. Our virtual music conference will be taking place on April the 25th. And we are so pleased to have some of the industry top professionals that will be giving wonderful classes for our independent artists. And we are particularly honored to have the president and the general manager for the Gospel Music Association, Mrs. Jackie Patillo herself, will be doing a masterclass for us. So I'm very, very excited about that. So if you want more information about the conference and how to register, please go to our website at www.shopindigo.com. That's S-H-O-P, shopindigo.com for more information on how to register. And if you're not a musician and you know someone that is and really wants to have more information about the industry, tell them about this conference. They will not want to miss it. But without further ado, I wanna take the opportunity right now to welcome to the show my very, very special guest. Maestro Nerva Altino. Thank you so much for being on Indigo Worship Live. It's such an honor to have you here tonight. The pleasure is mine. Thank you. Well, um, you just came out with an incredible, very candid book. I guess we want to call it in sort of an, a miniature autobiography because you're still pretty young. And <laughs> I sure, like to think so. <laughs> yeah, and a lot, a, a lot more life to live but it's more than a gift, which was released in February, I believe, and already doing well, doing extremely well. I, I hear you're in the top tier with Am on Amazon Books currently right now with this publication. Yes, so, God is good. Yes, very much so. And uh, so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to spend a little time with us to talk about the book. And, and we're going to you know touch on some of the some of your personal experience to the story. But yeah. before I talk about you, I thought it actually appropriate to begin the interview by reading the, this beautiful dedication. Mm. Because I believe that's where your story starts. Yes. And yes. so I'm gonna take the time to read the dedication in the book. Okay. And so please forgive me from looking down to my, to my uh, my watchers, but I really want to make sure I don't miss a word. This book is dedicated in memory of my parents, Jean and Ruth Altino. My mom and dad were the epitome of great parents. Their love and many sacrifices for my brother and I are the reason we were able to become the men we are today. My mother's care and gentle spirit, my father's faith, drive, and work ethics served as our core inspiration. My parents were praying people, and it is those prayers that have kept me throughout my years. They taught me to be a leader, to have and maintain a humble attitude, to serve God, to think big, to challenge myself, and to be grateful for every blessing, big or small. They have passed on, but their influence will remain with me for the rest of my life. This book is the culmination of the lessons they have taught me. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be one among the few men and women blessed with a platform to serve as an inspiration to others. 
but when you look at it, when you look at me, you are seeing the characters of both of them. Everything I have ever accomplished in life is a result of their sacrifice. Yeah. I was so moved by the way that was that you opened that because we are the product of our upbringing, but it was particularly Absolutely. the upbringing of your parents and what they instilled with you. Yeah. I really did not, it would have been remiss on me not to have them be the introduction to our interview. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, your parents have a very hard and interesting story. Yes. It starts out very romantically. <laughs> yeah, it, it does. It starts out very romantically. Um, but there, even in the beginning of their relationship, there were uh, just some things just because of the disparity of what was happening. And yeah. I you interjected also, I think it was uh, definitely necessary to talk about the governmental environment that also helped to facilitate a lot of the things that took place. Right. Because we're talking yeah. about in Haiti, uh, yes. during the 70s. Yes. Um, where, and even before the 70s, to be honest with you, yeah. where there was extreme dictatorship that was taking place. Yes. And corruption on high levels that really uh, spurred on the, the drive for your dad, particularly your mm -hmm. parents, mm -hmm. to get out of Haiti as quickly as possible. Yes. And quickly as possible, for those of you who don't know what that particularly is like, and I can say as an American citizen and born and raised here, that I don't know that story, but just reading your account of it as best that you could pen it, yeah. it was a hard, very um, scary undertaking, yes. and a lot of faith and drive for your dad and for, yeah. for, your, for your dad and your mother yes. to even do that because it was sacrifice, not just for him, but also leaving his wife and two sons behind. Yes. The pursuit of something that he knew was deep down inside of him and he knew he wanted to have his boys brought up in a, an environment where they could flourish and grow, be educated, um, that it was not gonna be easy. Yes. And so I, I, I really do want to, you to set that scene because I mean this is right. your story and I can you know I can relay the words in the book but that's not the right. same intensity because you actually had to hear the story even what you you know you would though you were young yeah but it was your dad who recounted the story was your mother who told the story exactly when you put all the mm -hmm. pieces together about yeah. how this even happened mm -hmm. well, both of them told me the story uh, my father told us that story regularly. You know, there are things, there, there were many details that he, uh, as he grew older, he recounted more details about it and, and he told us more about it. But we've heard that story throughout our lifetime. We've heard it from my, mo my mother's perspective, as well as my father. Uh, you know, and the story is basically my parents uh, got married in the very early 70s and, and, you know, they were trying to raise two boys, my brother and I and they couldn't make ends meet. My father couldn't find work as a construction worker. My mother suffered from uh, chronic asthma, so she couldn't work. So they had to find a way to try and, and uh, provide for their two kids. So both of them made this drastic decision for my father to leave Haiti. And of course, you, as you mentioned with the political turmoil that was transpiring at that time as well. So it made work impossible for him. So he basically he got on a banana boat and- And for those that don't know what a banana boat is, let's, let's give a description of what that is. Yeah. Banana boat is basically uh, just a boat. I, I don't think it has, uh, it's a motor boat. I don't, I don't recall, but it's just a big, like a canoe boat, but a big size one that left Haiti and on a two month journey to try and, and uh, the destination was supposed to be Miami, Florida. But my father decided to take that journey. Uh, you know, he spent two months in that banana boat at sea, mm. uh, experiencing a variety of adversities trying to make his way to the United States. But 
Uh, long story short, the, the boat didn't make it to the United States. It didn't make it to Florida. So my father, uh, the boat docked in, in the Bahamas, Nassau, Bahamas. Mm -hmm. And after two months at sea with very little or no food, uh, he was in the Bahamas as he was, as once they arrived, it was every man for themselves. And once he, once they arrived, my father was just wandering around walking, not knowing anyone. And then a gentleman called out his name. And uh, my father, <laughs> being a religious man, thought it was, you know, some sort of angel mm -hmm. was calling his name because he, first of all, he wasn't sure where he was. And I, and I just want to pause you for a second now. Mm -hmm. Did he know English at all? So he, is he still just, is he still just speaking French or did he know any English at all? No, he didn't know any English. The guy, the thing, the guy who called his name was a Haitian mm. who had been working on a cruise ship as a, as a chef. And the guy was the brother of a close friend of my father. The guy mm -hmm. recognized him, the guy called his name. Mm -hmm. And it was that guy who took my father and, and fed him and, and, and gave him, you know, shelter and so forth. And he helped my father, uh, you know, get some jobs as a construction to work in the Bahamas. So uh, while living there with the guy, my father was there illegally, obviously, and he began working and he sent just about all his earnings to my mother to take care of us in Haiti. Um, just kept, kept just enough for himself in order to take care of his uh, living expenses. So eventually after about two years, he was able to obtain a visa, a working visa to migrate to the United States from the Bahamas. What is the chances? What are the chances? Mm -hmm. But in divine providence, there really aren't any chances. Right. Because right. Um, I've been to the Bahamas and knowing where the boats dock at is the same basic location where those cruise ships always dock at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And where now people get off there. And of course there are a lot of shops and things like yeah. that in that area. So we're talking about right there on that dock area. Mm -hmm. And out of the millions of people that probably funnel through there from cruise ships from one place to another, whatever, yeah. Yeah. your father to be walking and then for someone to see him and then call yeah. his name. Yes, yes. That is not a coincidence. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. And when my father tells a story, he he's always maintained that uh, only prayer, God's prayer, you know, his prayers to God kept him because first of all, he did not know whether or not he would survive the trip. Yeah. So he, he said his only concern was his wife and kids. My father grew up, he was homeless. His own father died when he was 12 years old. So mm -hmm. he, he was homeless in his teens. Mm -hmm. So he, you know, he said that he did not want his kids to experience what he himself had experienced. So although he was determined, but he said it was his prayers to God, crying to God while on that banana boat to spare his life and make a way for him so that uh, he could find a way to raise his children uh, so that his children would not suffer the way he did as a teen. Yeah, and um, in, in, his, in the book, you talk about the fact that your dad only actually went him, went him to uh, sixth grade education because of the death of his father. Yes, yes. So, you know, that's that's a little boy. Yes, yes. That's a little boy yes. having to now take the responsibility of trying to help make his, you know, make means available for his immediate family. Yes. And how many people, and now we're talking about once again, the political climate, the things that are mm -hmm. going over there, corruption, right. all kinds of things right. going on. Yes. that, um, you know, that he would be able to find any type of work at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know it, it had to have been extremely menial, yes. um, but there's something inside of him. Yes. And yes. Uh, I'm getting the sense there's something inside an Altino man <laughs> that God puts there. Yeah, yeah. That God puts there. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. God has blessed us with, uh, you know, determination and drive, mm -hmm. uh, a love for people, a love for family. And those are the qualities I think that a lot of the Altino men have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, and, that, and I'm really sensing that. And, and that's why it was so important for me to bring your parents into the introduction yeah. of the story, because yeah. it doesn't just begin with you. It came no. from somewhere. 
Yes. yes. And we wanted to make sure we honored them that way. Indeed. So after spending that time there, he finally, you know, finally, you know, he gets to the United States. Now mm-hmm. we're going through the transition of, you know, now he's working to get your your mom here. Yes. Try to get 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 you guys here, you and your brother, right. Robinson. Right. right. And so by the time he's able to get her here and secure her here, mm-hmm. she now has to make the heartbreaking decision to leave her two boys. Yes. 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 So when I say that this is a really riveting book, I really mean this is a, a page turner. And I would definitely recommend if you want to get more behind the scenes on this story to get this book more than a gift. Um, so when she leaves, mm-hmm. you are left with in the care of a family that um, for the sake of the show, I'm not going to say their mm-hmm. name. Right. But you are left in the care of people that your parents sort of trusted. Yes. But yeah. it also but it turned out to be unfortunately um a very tragic situation. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so when I was asking you before the show to write a book like this and to be as open and to mm-hmm. now have to go back to this trail and revisiting those steps. Yeah. The process of all of that. Mm-hmm. How were you able to put that to paper without really feeling like, because I felt like as I'm a mother, my husband, I'm the mother of four children. Mm-hmm. And I just felt like reading that part, this portion, this is early in the book. Yeah. As a mother, my heart cried out to you. And I wish, boy, yeah. I had, you know, my husband, I lived, you know, in, our, in my mad imagination, right. to hug you guys and let mm-hmm. you know it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know, it's going to be okay. But, right. um, but talk about that, that, that situation a little bit. That situation was quite challenging to write, first of all. I had to relive those memories as I was writing, you know, those are things that um, I try not to think about as I grew up. Uh, But when I decided to embark on this journey of writing this story, my story, uh, a lot of of those events came back to me and and they're still in my memory as clear as day. I remember every one of them, you know, as well as I go to write them. Um, But this particular part of the story is basically, as you said, my mother had to leave us in Haiti to come to my father. Um, and, and she left us in the care of my godfather, who, who grew up with my father as his friend. But this, this guy, uh, he and his wife were very abusive people. Hmm. They agreed to watch over my brother and I because they saw it as an opportunity for themselves because my parents would be sending them money every month. Uh, to care for us, but they took the money. They they um, sent their own kids to school, to the you know good schools that my parents had requested that we go to. Uh, they didn't feed us regularly. Hmm. They physically and verbally abused us on a regular basis. I mean, I'm talking where you know my brother w- was playing, and he hurt himself. And instead of you know feeling some sort of sympathy or empathy towards him, my godfather's wife punched my brother in the mouth because he hurt himself. She punched him in his mouth. Uh, we were beaten regularly and, and cursed out regularly. So, uh, and my parents were not aware of any of this. They weren't aware of it. So um, this was, you know, it was quite traumatic because we had known abuse prior to that. So that was, this was our first experience of having experienced such a thing. Um, and you know, we, we missed our parents. Our father was here and, and, and mom came afterwards. So we felt like we were orphans, yeah. orphans, basically. So, um, yeah, that was quite a dramatic experience. And trying to write that story was pretty challenging. Wow. Uh, I, 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 I dare say it was, um, and I'm sure it was. Uh, yeah. It was hard for me to read it, um, mm-hmm. to be honest yeah. with you. Yeah. But um, to, get the, uh, to get to know a little bit more about you and... Yeah where you, how you became who you are, that is still part of your story. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So at about, is it, are we talking like 10 years old, you are now mm-hmm. brought to the United States, you and your yes. brother. 
It's just, yes. just you and your brother yeah. and you're brought to yeah. the United States. And yeah. I find it really interesting because you talk about even while you were in the care of the Godfather and his wife, mm-hmm. that um, your access to the accessibility to television was there. Yes. And was. so to have these scenes of New York City. Yeah. And how you felt about you know things you saw as far as New York City was concerned. Right. Um, and then to have you know two little boys on a plane. Um, I thought that I thought that was like a sweet wink. You know, when, uh, <laughs> when the store just brought you guys up to the first class and you got a chance to sit up there and have a little more space and a little more food. And, right. um, but then here you are, you're looking out this window, two little guys look out a window, landed in New York City, and you're thinking you're hitting, you know, you hit pretty, for the most part, these are my words, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> That's how we felt. <laughs> you know, New York City, big city of dreams, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> and wow, our parents are, you know, they're there. And um, that reunion, um, yeah. what, I can, what I can sense from the book was just so, I mean, I'm sure indescribable for you. You probably remember the same embrace from your yes. mom and your dad that day and yes. um, how they felt about seeing their little boys. Because your mm-hmm. father at this point had not seen you for almost what, five years. Yes, that's so right. So that's a big transition from the last time he saw you and now he sees you five years older. Yes. But, um, interesting enough, they... I don't want to dismiss, they took a moment to kind of look at you both. Yes, they did. We had lost so much weight because like I said, we weren't fed very much. So uh, they were very concerned by our parents. Uh, and, you know, it was after we'd arrived here, we, they learned of the abuse that we were experiencing within the last couple of years mm. before finally arriving here. Mm-hmm. So they were very concerned. Uh, my my father wanted to call the family friend who was watching over us, but he said he's just going to leave it in God's hands. Uh, so he didn't contact him. He didn't say anything to him. He didn't reach out to him to say thank you or or this or to basically tell him more for what he'd done to to us. But my father just left it alone and said it's in God's hands. God God will deal with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which was very difficult, I'm sure. But uh, yes, it was. Nonetheless. The most his, the basic concern is he had both his boys with him. That's right. And that That's he's right. not going to let that happen again. Right. right. Um, your first introduction to being here, yes. you don't speak English. No. Um, and um, as you're getting acclimated, there's acclimation to the American way of eating. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, so uh, before, I, I love the fact that you're talking about, your mom says, uh, there's snacks and the juice in the refrigerator. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the first time of that, you know, we, before you barely were getting one meal a day, and so now you have access to, you know, eat what you want, there's snacks and juice in there. Yes, uh, yes. I thought that was really, very, really, very, very sweet. So mm-hmm. you are coming now to, well, we have to educate you. Mm-hmm. So it's time for you to go to school. And, yes. Um, and your first experience in an American mm-hmm. school mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. I believe in Haiti, you were coming in about sixth or seventh grade, depending on the education, because our education system is different. Right, here, right. To find you being placed where? I know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Well, when I left Haiti, I was 10 years old in the seventh grade. So uh, when I got here, I was supposed to have been placed in the fifth grade. I, I was skipped two grade levels uh, when I was in Haiti. I skipped kindergarten and I skipped, uh, I skipped, I forget which, which grade it was, but I, I skipped the fifth grade. But when I came here, I was in the seventh grade at 10 years old, but I was placed in the fourth grade. Yeah, so uh, it was because of mainly, you know, I, I didn't speak a word in English. The only word I knew in English was good morning. Mm, uh, so, okay. so I, I was placed, you know, two grade levels, one grade level behind, you know, for my age. Mm-hmm. So my age group at that time was in the, in the fifth grade. Okay. So being in the fourth grade, that was a challenge as well, because I couldn't keep up with the schoolwork because I couldn't speak English. I mean, talk about culture shock. I mean, yeah. you're, just being, it's, it's, it, you're literally coming to some place where you don't even know the language and no. yet you're expected to get an education. Yes. Um, yeah. But uh, the Lord placed you in a, in, a, in a very nice class with a very nice teacher. Yes, Mrs. Foster was her Mrs. name. Mrs. Foster, yes. Yeah. And uh, was very, gave you, that, that's a soft place to land. 
But yes. you're now right. in an environment mm-hmm. where you were with American kids. Yes, yes. And that experience? That was a traumatic experience. It <laughs> has, that experience has shaped me. Mm. Uh, you know, for the rest of my life, because now for the first time I was experiencing bullying. Mm. Uh, the kids didn't like, not all the kids, but m- many other boys really um, harassed me, picked on me, called me names, spat on me, uh, beat me up for the simple fact that I, I looked different and I didn't speak the language. So it, it was it was a shame to say the least, because um, there were thoughts of suicide. I, I wanted to kill myself mm. uh, because I couldn't take the bullying anymore, you know? So um, this went on throughout elementary school as well as the first two years of junior high school. Wow. So bullying played a key role and which in turn made me turn to the streets eventually when in my teens. Yeah, because definitely there is a banking, a deposit of, of anger. Yes. Brewing that yes. actually even started before the states is actually coming from Haiti. Right. I mean, that to the yes. states. Yes, yeah. yes, and, that was the beginning of it. Yeah, right. and, it's, and, and at some point, enough becomes enough. That's right. That's right. So, and in, in the midst of all of this, though, there were those light spots mm-hmm. uh, with your church association. Yes, yes. And uh, one of the things that your dad had for you when he came here was piano. Yes. Yes. In in this small New York basement apartment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if anyone's not familiar with the small basement apartment in New York, it's small. <laughs> <laughs> so to have a piano in the middle of it um, yes. as a, a gift for for you, but also yes. for your dad yes. who yes. really began to take lessons himself. That's right. Um, that was the beginning of a doorway. It sure was, was going to take you into places that you never dreamed that you would be. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that, you know, having that piano, when we first arrived here and we saw the piano, we first walked into the, the, the apartment, we thought our parents were rich. Mm-hmm. But we had never heard that uh, of people having pianos in, in their homes. That, that's, that was unrealistic to me. Mm-hmm. So um, I was always fascinated by the piano. My father said I loved the piano since I was a baby. So. Um, Immediately, he started teaching me the very next day, and piano became an escape for me. Yeah. Uh, as I dealt with all the bullying I was experiencing at school, so I would uh, pour all that rage into um, practicing in the evenings. So now, with the development of the of your increased piano skills, mm-hmm. you're now also taking it into your worship experience or your yes. worship experience. Yeah. Yes. So. Along the way, as you're becoming more and more proficient in terms of playing in church, mm-hmm. you are brought to a gentleman that you admire called Brother yes. D. Yes, yes. And I think that is, now that one is another step in that mm-hmm. direction of where we end up with you today. Right, and right. So I talk about, you know, when you first seen him play, because I, I mm-hmm. thought that was also a very, you know, through the eyes of a child watching someone mm-hmm. who... Right is playing uh, the organ in church and just hearing the sounds from the pipe and everything else and right. you know everything. So what, do you still remember what that sound like and what that felt like? Yes, I do. Um, I had, first of all, I had never seen anyone play at that level. Hmm. Um, there were many great musicians throughout uh, our community. I was still new here. So I saw a variety of musicians, uh, good musicians throughout the Haitian community, as well as, you know, um, I, I say Caribbean, West Indian uh, churches and Linden SDA churches where we attended. When I first heard Brother D, I, I lost it. I told mm. my father I wanted to be just like that. Uh, I became obsessed with this man uh, to the point where my father said, okay, enough of this. I'm going to introduce you to him. I said, no, you can't introduce me to him. I can't meet. It's like, you know, being introduced and in, in, a young basketball player being introduced to LeBron James. Yeah. You're, you're mm-hmm. intimidated. So mm-hmm. that's what he was to me. Yeah. And I remember the first time uh, when my father finally, you know, probably about a month or so after we were here, my father, uh, you know, took me to the organ to meet him after church. And 
my father told him, you know, my son has been admiring you and so forth. He said, he wants to meet you. He's, he's scared. He's intimidated by so forth. <laughs> and the man looked at me with a smile. He shook my hand, first of all, and I was in awe. Wow. And then he took one look at me. I didn't know what he said. My father translated for me. He told my father that I would be the next church organist for that church. Wow. He had never met me. He didn't know me. I don't know if he saw the desire to want to learn in my eyes, mm -hmm. but he said this to my father. And even if my, after my father repeated it to me, I didn't believe him. I said, no way, I can't, I, I can't be that. I'm just a small boy from Haiti. I just, I can't, I can't be like that. But yeah. that, 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 but God had other plans. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so he ended up taking you under his wing. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yes, he did. In a ma in a major way. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're talking, we're talking about going into you know, some introduction of classical pieces. Yes. Yes. And let's talk, I, you got to tell the story. The mm -hmm. three pieces that you had to do in a year. Uh-huh. That, that you got tired of. Let's talk about that for a minute. <laughs> well, uh, Brother D had a system where he um, he used three pieces a year. Each year, every student would would take an examination to go into the next grade level. He used a system from the um, Trinity College in, in London, mm -hmm. which required a student to learn three pieces within a year to, uh, you know, to prepare for this examination. Mm -hmm. I always you know make sure that i learn my pieces ahead of time uh so that i don't have to spend an entire year on just three pieces so mm -hmm. i would learn them put them aside and then i would work on other pieces um and then when we got close to the examination i would you know go back to those three pieces and i would always do well in my examinations mm -hmm. yeah and with that proficiency and gaining that proficiency, I think during the course of that, you talk about the fact that the first time now seeing, we're talking about um, the possibility of a, a Black musician mm -hmm. in the classical sense. Who yes. At the time, you weren't seeing a lot of them at mm -hmm. all. No, no. Yeah. And there's a particular Sunday, and I really want to point this out because I thought that was, I, 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 that thought was just great. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Sunday where he is showing you a, a I guess a uh concert pianist concert, yeah that's pianist yes mm -hmm. and there are a couple of people that are playing and one in particular and as soon as I read his name I said Andre Watts yes <laughs> for those of you that don't know Andre Watts he is like the I mean he's an yes. incredible incredible classical pianist and yes. I'm sure you could probably go on YouTube and look at yeah. find some pieces oh, yeah. of him yeah. and um he was just a master at it. And when you talk about his style, I think yes. before Barack Obama, uh, Andre Watch had the swagger first. That's right, that's right. He did, he had the swagger first. Yes. Um, and in a, in a realm where you saw very few, if not any of us mm -hmm. in that genre, you saw more in the, in this in the opera section. You know, we have few yeah, more. Opera, opera section, that. I mean, classical piano too, but the thing is to be frank, uh, I never saw, a black, I had never seen a black classical pianist prior to Andre Watson. We used to watch PBS a lot. Um, and we we would see other European greats like the Horowitz, you know, Rubinstein and so forth. Uh, but although we admired them and wanted to do what they were doing, mm -hmm. we couldn't, we didn't feel a connection with them because they didn't look like me. So, but this is for both my brother and I. So we, um, we didn't think it was possible since we hadn't seen anyone who looked like us playing classical piano at that level. Then we saw Andre Watts one mm -hmm. Sunday morning while after a piano lesson with, with, with Brother D. Yeah. And he gathered, he, I don't remember how many students were there at the time, but he had all the students gather around together and, and we were watching this a VHS, uh, you know, taping mm -hmm. that he had, mm -hmm. he had taped from, from that concert. And all the students were complaining, oh, this is boring. I can't take that. I don't want to do it. What do I have to watch? You know? <laughs> I'm looking and, for this, this quote because the end of it, you and your brother are just like. Oh my gosh, we lost <laughs> it. <laughs> we lost it. We both clapped. Yeah. And the other students, they, they were relieved that it was over. We, we, I mean, it was just one piece that he let us hear, mm -hmm. but that, that was all we needed. And so, uh, you know, we were so fascinated by it. Uh, we, we, 
called Brother D. He said, can we come and watch the entire recital on another, another night? And he was kind enough to let us do that. So we went back to his home and watched the entire recital. I mean, that was the beginning for us. Yeah. yeah. Prior to that, we wanted to, you know, we took piano lessons to, to, to develop a, a good, you know, into good musicians. Yeah. But we, um, our intention was to just, you know, play for church, which is still great too, but we didn't know the capabilities of yeah. what could have transpired, you know, um, uh, prior to, to Andre Watts. Yeah. So at that point, prior to that, to seeing that video, my father wanted one of us to become a doctor, another one a pastor. Mm -hmm. Neither one of us wanted any any part of that. Mm -hmm. I had a gift to, to, for art. I, I used to be able to draw. So I was considering being an architect. Mm -hmm. So that that's what my goal is. If you were to go back to my um, junior high school yearbook, I, um, it says Nerva Altino, architect. Mm. So when I saw Andre Watts, that was the end of the architecture goal for me. Yeah. I wanted to be a concert pianist, a classical mm. concert pianist. I wanted to play with orchestras. I wanted to play at Lincoln Center, Carnegie Hall. I wanted to be Andre Watts. That was my goal. He changed my life and as well as my brothers. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it, later on, we'll find out that actually it goes full circle because you had an opportunity to meet Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I didn't mention this in my book, but Andre Watts was a friend of my professor, Kessner Robertson, in college. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I've, I've had uh, I've met him plenty of times and, and he's very kind, man. Very kind, man. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So as we are moving through your story and mm -hmm. we're, we're really progressing, but things are still are not going well. Right. In the in your personal life mm -hmm. and where you're growing up in your school environment. Right, right. And there's a shift that takes place that mm -hmm. leads you down a very, very hard road. Yes. And let's, and let's talk about that. Well, um, after I got to the eighth grade, I had made up my mind that I was done being bullied because I've gotten beat, I'd gotten beat up so many times. I, I, I developed a chip on my shoulders and I became an angry teenager. Mm -hmm. And I developed a very violent temper. I wanted to beat up people, particularly guys in the streets mm. because of all that I had gone through um, in elementary school as well as, as um, junior high school. So um, I've had experiences where people tried to shoot me, tried to stab me. And by the time I um, got to high school, I decided that in order to combat that, I had to be the man in high school. Mm -hmm. I had to be the most popular guy in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to be a guy who avoided being beat, beaten up. I wanted to be the guy that the bullies feared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, when I got to high school, Hillcrest High School in Queens, New York, um, I made it a goal to become that. And, and of course, when you when you get to that point, you know you don't care anymore. Although I knew I had a potential with this talent that God had bestowed upon me. Yeah. At that point, I, to be honest with you, I didn't care whether I lived or died. Mm. That was my attitude. Yeah. So I, I I developed this fearlessness, um, not caring. So I made sure that I found the right friends. Who were carrying the same chip on their shoulders as I was. Mm -hmm. And we created our own crew, if you will. And together we encountered so many violent confrontations in the streets. I mean, I remember one scenario and I developed a very a, a deep hate for bullies. Mm -hmm. So much so I would encounter fights, not because I start them, but because I would see a bully picking on somebody that, yeah. that I associated with a new and I would immediately get in that bully's face. Yeah. So um, one violent encounter I had was I one guy came up to my school to pick on one of my friends and I got in his face. And he didn't like that. So he came back the next school with a next next day with a gun. Hmm. So he come, he stood in a corner yelling. So I'm going towards him and somebody warned me not to go over there because he had a gun in his hand. But anyway, um, I didn't go, so he left. After he, and then I find out where he hung out. My friends and I went to look for him. 
because our goal is to get them mm. or whatever that meant. Yeah. Anyway, as we approached him, he pulled out his gun and began shooting. He began shooting. Thankfully, he missed. Mm -hmm. None of us were hurt, mm -hmm. but we were determined to, to get him mm -hmm. after that. But um, as it turned out, I heard that he moved out of state and, and never to return to New York. So thankfully, none of us were hurt. But um, uh, but the, the turning point for me also came when I was a senior in high school. Another situation, I was with uh, five of my, well, four of my friends, with five of us. And a group of guys, probably about 15, 20 of them, came to us. For whatever reason, I, I, I think it was mistaken identity. I don't know. They came to us and wanted to beat us up. Well, we immediately, we immediately turned into the aggressors. Mm. And um, we fought all of them. Wow. The th well, three of us fought all of them. Two, two of my friends ran. They ran. And I understand that because it was a pretty scary situation. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they took off and, and the three of us stood and, and fought these guys. And I was so angry at the time, I unknowingly broke my hand um, by, by, you know, d yeah. during that fight. So here I am, a budding concert pianist with a broken right hand because I, you know, was engaging in, in, in um, a cavalier lifestyle, if you will, where I didn't care. So it began to take its toll on my, on my future. Yeah. But I, bro I broke my hand, you know. And when, when, when that happened and you realized you had broke your hand mm -hmm. in the midst of everything else that all the other chips that you have on your shoulder from yeah. all the years of bullying and mm -hmm. just being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. When that happened, now we're adding another layer mm -hmm. of what is going to happen with my life now, because right. the dreams that I had, you right. almost see them almost in your mind at the time, almost crumbling before your very eyes. Yes. Because yes. There's a technique and a muscular memory that happens mm -hmm. fingering. Yes. That yes. Um, that now you can't use this hand. Right. So right. doing this process, what what is happening during this process? During that process, rather than to allow myself to get down, uh, my left hand at the time was was rather weak, pianistically speaking. Mm -hmm. So I uh, my hand was in a cast for two months, my right hand. So I decided to work on my left hand and strengthen my left hand. Uh, pianistically, I worked every day for two, three hours, just my left hand only. And by the time my right hand came off, came out of the cast, my right, my left hand was just as strong as my right hand. Mm. So rather than sit down and feel sorry for myself, I decided to do something. So it was an opportunity for me to to strengthen my left hand because had I, had I not had this experience of breaking my right hand, I don't know that my left hand would have as gotten would have gotten strong as as it did at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and th and that kind of. I, I, I want to put this in, interject this into here because it's not that God allowed this to happen, but what yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. What, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. And what, what it says to me is God will take an opportunity, even when it looks like it's not an opportunity, That's to right. use it for your good and even yes. make it better than it was before. Right. Because it's right. that that enhanced skill would strengthen your left hand. Yes. Now you're able to actually even propel yourself even further in your yes. career. Yes. which is actually amazing, absolutely right. amazing, absolutely amazing. Right. right. So, but the story's not over because no, you had no. an incident that literally could have put you behind bars. Yes, yes. Um, as I stated, throughout my teens, I, I encountered violent situations. Um, and then this carried on to college. I went to a Christian college in the middle of nowhere, the South Lancaster, Massachusetts, where um AUC AUC yes Atlantic Union College mm -hmm. and it was my junior year um at that time uh, my cousin was living with me my younger cousin and he, although AUC was not in a a uh, town where one would encounter violent situations but going out to clubs you know I, I love to party at the time going out to club and parties, college parties, I would still encounter fights. Even in malls, shopping malls, I would encounter fights. Well, a turning point for me, and at the time also, I was an atheist. Mm. 
I stopped going to church. I didn't believe in God. And, and, and so I find all the excuses not to, you know, follow any sort of uh, spiritual uh, pathway. So one day, my cousin and I were driving and we were in a, you know, um, I think it was a pretty, pretty bad neighborhood, if you will, in Massachusetts. And I nearly hit this, this guy who jumped out into the street. So I, I was able to stop my car just in time to avoid hitting him. And in doing so, thankfully I did not hit him, but he got angry and had a few choice words for us. So my cousin in turn, you know, returned <laughs> the, the mm -hmm. verbal abuse. Mm -hmm. Anyway, before the, the situation escalated, I just took off to avoid any, you know, yeah. further, um, you know, violent encounter. Yeah. I um, needed to put gas in my car. So I put, I pull up at a gas station. And as soon as I pull up at the gas station, I got out of the car to uh, pump gas. My cousin and me were both surrounded by a group of guys, Hispanic guys. I'm like, what was going on? And then the guy whom we had just had the encounter with, he came out of the crowd mm -hmm. and exchanged words. Um, it, they had, you know, two by fours, they had a gun. And so before we knew it, a fight began. They struck me in the head with the with the with the two by four. And I, at that point, I remember I thought there was this gonna be this was gonna be the end of me and my cousin because there was no way we should have gotten out of that. It was just two of us and quite a few of them. And I remember thinking, I didn't say it out loud, but I just remember, I remember thinking, God, if you get me out of this, I promise I'm going back to church. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as the fight broke out, the guy shot me with the two by four, I fell against the car and all those guys just got on me. And I just put my head up like this to take cover. And my cousin was, you know, probably near me fighting himself, trying to defend himself. But there were so many of them, there, was, there wasn't much I could do. But the guy with the gun was trying to shoot it, trying to shoot me. And as he tried to take the shot, he couldn't because his friends were in his way. Hmm. So he kept telling him, move out of the way, move out of the way so I could take my shot. They wouldn't move. But he was determined because he was determined to shoot me. So once I realized this, uh, I just began swinging as widely, as hard as I could. And doing so, the guy with the two by four dropped the two by four. After he dropped it, I picked up the two by four and just start hitting everybody. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know where the gun went. I didn't see the gun. Uh, maybe the guy dropped it. But next thing I knew, they started running. But quite, quite a few of them were hurt because I was hitting them on their legs, on their heads. And the guy who hit me with the two by four, he tried to take off. Uh, running on his bike. He was on a bicycle. They, they were in cars, some were on foot, and he was on a bicycle. So I went after him and with the same two by four and hit him on the side of his head the same way he had hit me. Mm. He fell unconscious. His body was shaking. And as he was down, I kept kicking him, kicking him on his head. And my cousin came over and doing the same thing. As we were both doing that, the cops were coming. And that is what they saw. My cousin and me beating up this guy. They didn't see what was happening prior to that. So um, I got arrested. My cousin, Both my cousin and me um, got arrested. And the ambulance came and took the guy uh, who we had down. And we were charged for assault with a deadly weapon. Well, during our first court date, I learned that the guy that I had struck fell into a coma. So now I was facing charges with an assault, assault with deadly with a deadly weapon. And if he died, it would have been a murder charge. Mm. I thought there was no way I was gonna beat this case because even though I was defending myself, I mean, if this guy dies, that's it. Mm. Well, uh, long story short, uh, eventually, uh, witnesses came out and and testified that my cousin and me were defending ourselves. You got you. But you know, I had a court appointed lawyer mm -hmm. and he scared me because I called him 
um, as the case was progressing, you know, uh, uh, you know, during the months that it was progressing. And he didn't remember who I was. Hmm. So I called in a favor from a family friend who was an attorney and the family friend called him up and told him that he was going to take over the case if this guy didn't take the case seriously. Well, after doing that, uh, not too much time after that, I got a call that the case was dismissed because, of, thank God, there were a bunch of witnesses who came forward wow. and said that those two guys were defending themselves. They were just the two of them against all these guys and they were defending themselves. So the case got dismissed. And after that, I kept my word. I, I went back to church and, and I never left. I never left. <laughs> okay. So for, the, for many of us who are hearing this, that we kind of need to take our breath for a second because that is a whole lot. Yeah that you were going through at that time. Yes. yes. Now we're not talking about your hand anymore being broken. Now mm -hmm. we're talking potentially spending the, potentially the rest of your life behind bars. Yes. yes. And once again, God intervened to block that. Yes. Even though, you know, if you look back at it, maybe, you know, I, if you, hindsight is always 20, 20, maybe I shouldn't have done that or I should have called for help or whatever. <laughs> But, mm -hmm. um, but the fact is that God, his hand was still on you. Yes, and yes, it was. All the attack that the enemy yeah. has, the enemy has been trying to get you for, at this point, really all of your life. Yes, yes, because he has. The potential, the potential yes. that he could see that was in you and in your brother as well and in your family and the legacy yes. of your family. Right. So we are, we have, praise the Lord, we have, that case got dismissed yes you've now renewed your faith you're back in church yeah. and you're continuing the process in your musical career I am. I am and so how are you pushing forward after all that leaving all of that i'm going to call it for lack of a better way to describe it that mm -hmm. horrific mess behind mm -hmm. well first i had to change my mindset i had to change my thinking uh, you know, as I got older, I realized that you attract the things that you think about most. Mm -hmm. And during my younger years, I watched violent movies. I thought violently. I, I, I got a rush from fighting. I, I enjoy fighting and confrontations. So I had to change my mindset. And it took a lot of prayer. It took a lot of hard work to change my character mm -hmm. as a whole because I had become a person that I shouldn't have become especially having been brought up by my parents. Yeah. So uh, all those experiences shaped who I was. So I, I, during my 20s, I had to make a conscious effort to work on my character in order to become a better person. So once I began to do that, those experiences uh, were no longer an issue for me. I didn't encounter violent situations anymore. Um, I became more spiritual. Yeah. There were still still things that I struggled with, but um, that aspect of my life was left behind. That's um, in incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, and for those of you who are still with us and watching this interview, please, um, this book by Maestro Nerva Altino is a page turner. I promise you it is. And it's available wherever you uh, purchase your books online. And at this point, I wanted to say, I'm, I'm just... Can I say I'm proud of you and I don't really know you? <laughs> Can I say that? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm so Thank proud of where your mindset went and that you didn't give up no. and that you still left a door open. There was still a door open for you to allow God to come in and do yes. what he's always wanted to do through you. Yes. And yes. to do it as such a high excellence is just absolutely just amazing. Thank you. Um, so we're, so now I, I, we got to get to car. We got to get to, 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 to Lincoln center because that's <laughs> something that you've been working for. Yeah. Yeah. And there's stories in between then, and we're not going to yeah. go into those because we need you to get the book more than a gift. Right. And right. so let's, let's, let's fast forward to Lincoln center. When mm -hmm. you finally got the opportunity to play in Lincoln center. Yes. And found out, first of all, found that you were going to, what uh -huh. was that like? That was quite quite something, you know. I, I um, that Lincoln, to be honest with you, was a 
vengeance concert, if you will. Mm. When I was in grad school at the Manhattan School of Music, I had a teacher there. Uh, I was his only black student. He was a white Jewish man who was very condescending in his approach in dealing with me. He didn't think that uh, black students could do much in the world of classical music. So he prevented me from uh, gaining lots of opportunities at MSM. There was a competition that as long as you, you're, you're a student at the school, you could enter and no blacks had ever won it, a piano competition. Mm -hmm. um, I asked him if I could enter that competition. He said, no. He said, you don't stand a chance at winning. I'm not letting you enter. So uh, I carried that for a while. And so when I got the news that I, you know, I, I was able, I was going to be performing at Lincoln Center, I said, okay, now's my chance to get back at him for what he did because I knew Lincoln Center, uh, everybody hears about the performances that happens at Lincoln Center when you're at Manhattan School of Music or Juilliard. So mm -hmm. Uh, and that concert attracted media attention. We're in NBC. Uh, we were in, in the New York newspapers. So the word got back to him. So um, that was our official debut mm -hmm. as, as concert artists. Uh, my brother and I each played with you know, a piece with an orchestra. And um, so the feeling was surreal, to be honest with you, because this was something that both my brother and me we're working towards. And when we saw Andre Watts, that was the goal. Yeah. So we, we, we performed that Lincoln Center three times. And, but that first time will always be extra special because uh, that was our dream to, 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 to do that concert, a concert like that at Lincoln Center, like Andre Watts did. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it, there was a sense of gratification there um, because I, I knew the word would get back to my teacher. I wanted to show him um, you know, you couldn't stop me yeah. in spite of who, who, what you tried to do. You couldn't stop me. And interestingly, he called me after the concert, but I never returned the call. Um, you know, I, I was still young at the time mm -hmm. I was in my late twenties. So now I stopped doing things to try and get revenge for people on people. You know, mm -hmm. perhaps my mindset was not right to, to want to do it as a revenge mm -hmm. concert, but I, I just not what I would advise young people to do. However, when people put you down, use their words as a form of inspiration to yeah. work harder, to push harder. And success is the best revenge that you could, you could uh, attain. And, uh, but don't, don't make the, the purpose of, of your goal just to get revenge on people. Your goal is to inspire others. In the process, uh, those who put you down, if you're lucky, God will, will let them see you succeed. Hmm. That's revenge enough. That's, that's revenge enough. So um, I hold nothing against my former teacher at MSM um, because God did not allow him to stop me from doing anything. Yeah. I believe that if I put forth the work, I will succeed. And that's not just me. That's just, that's anybody. You put forth the work, you eventually going to succeed if you, if you don't give up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things I know that is very quite obvious because there is, uh, I'm going to still say in a, in a genre, there's still not a lot of uh, representation of yes. color. Yes. Um, we talk about the fact of even like getting bookings initially and mm -hmm. having to be your own manager yeah because yeah. of just the 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 stigma mm -hmm. and or not stigma the prejudice that's just called yeah, absolutely yeah. yeah it was just downright prejudice yeah against um black musicians particularly mm -hmm. on that high level yes but to see where you are now mm -hmm. um how has how are things changed from then to where you are now, because obviously you've played Lincoln Center, Lincoln Center several mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. You've also been at Carnegie Hall, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you played there. You and your brother Robinson, and so who is an accomplished, um, you know, a pianist himself, mm -hmm. and played together. And I've seen yeah. some of the pictures, and it's actually mm -hmm. fantastic to see. Um, and we're going to talk about him in a little bit in terms of what is that experience like with him, but. Um, cool. Has has the has classical music changed 
from that point now to where it is now? Have you seen any any progression? Uh, well, I wouldn't say progression because it has, uh, I think it's taken a step back, if mm. you will, because the audience base for classical music has shrunk. So therefore, uh, my brother and I had to be creative in order to uh, keep ourselves appealing mm. to the general public. So rather than performing Beethoven and Mozart for, a comp uh, uh, you know, for an entire evening, we have learned to incorporate other things within our, our uh, concerts. So our concerts, yes, it's supposed to be entertaining and, and so forth, but at the same time, we, 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 incorpor we have incorporated ministry within that. So we would play a Beethoven piece, but we would also play a gospel song. Mm -hmm. So we, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm an arranger, so I arrange a lot of uh, piano pieces for my brother and I. So we try to make it so that people can relate to it. Because when we were performing all classical programs, the audiences that we attract mm -hmm. um, could not really relate to what we were doing. So therefore we had to make our concerts more relatable. Mm -hmm. uh, so it has worked for us. Is that It has worked for us because uh, one of the things that I'm proud of is when somebody would come to me and say, I was blessed, not I was dazzled, Mm -hmm. what they said i was blessed so that 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 let us know that we have found our niche and 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 you know so being playing all classical programs is not necessarily the, the only way to do it well i'm so glad that you were able to take a step back and um it's kind of disheartening as you just describe it that we sort of made mm -hmm. we didn't make any progress we actually made a step back right the creativity of god really kind of comes in and through you and your brother to yes. look at it differently and carve yeah. out a niche that still allows you to uh, see the training all the years mm -hmm. of hard work but right. also embracing the richness of our culture in other areas too like through gospel yeah. pieces and probably yes. just arranging those as well in a different way and mm -hmm. it differently so mm -hmm. i think that is absolutely absolutely tremendous yeah thank so, you at what point now, what is that like playing with your brother? Like, <laughs> really, what is that like playing with your brother? It's a joy. It's a joy. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, now I've created a rule that, you know, I, my brother's the only person that I, I, I perform with in terms of collaborating uh, as a piano duet. You know, I had an experience uh, a couple of years ago where I had to, to perform with an organist and that didn't go too well. So, and I broke that rule of only perform. If you're gonna book me, you can't book me to perform with another musician. It's me or my brother or no one else. Mm. So my brother, we-, we Is that because feel, this is the synergy that you both have? Or you, yes. you have an unspoken understanding technically yes. about what you do? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have such great chemistry uh, when, when, when we perform together. He knows exactly what I'm going to do and I know exactly what he's going to do musically on stage now. The, the things that we do on stage that aren't planned, mm -hmm. but we could sense it from each other. So we've developed this chemistry that has made us, uh, you know, into one mm -hmm. when, when, when we perform. So he understands my style and we're very different, mm -hmm. both personally and musically. Uh, but I understand him, he understands me. And, and there's no one I, I would rather perform with than my brother. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Now you actually have a, um, a music school that you both have. Yes, you operate yes. In New York. And yes. uh, tell us about that. And uh, when did that get started? We founded a music school uh, about two years ago, uh, the Altino Brothers School of Music. Um, we operate out, out of Queens, New York. And the, the pandemic happened, so we had to shut it down. We lost over 90% of our students, not 95, I think percent of, of all the students we had. Uh, we taught voice and well, I said teach voice and as well as uh, piano. I, I don't teach voice the voice, I teach the piano, but we have voice teachers mm -hmm. who do that. Uh, but I had contracted COVID as well. So after I recovered, my brother and I both decided that it's best to have the school, you know, run the school virtually. And that has worked out so well for us. We have more students now than we've ever had before. Wow. wow. And we're able to expand where we teach students, not just locally, but internationally. I have a student in China 
Wow. So, yeah, so it, it has worked out and I'm thankful for that because, you know, during this pandemic, a lot of musicians aren't able to work because there is no work for, for a lot of us. So yeah. uh, I was able to, 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 my brother and I were able to establish this virtual school. So now if we ever get back to a normal lifestyle, whatever that looks like, <laughs> I don't think I'm going back to teaching in person because, you know, it, it gives me so, so many more options to, to, to have, um, you know, when you're teaching virtually. Now, you made mention of the fact that you having COVID this past year. Yes. And, um, unfortunately, um, you had a very heart wrenching and tragic loss this year as well. Yes. The past yes. year, who also um, mm. passed away during this pandemic. And, yes. Um, yes. Our sincere condolences to you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And Thank um, you. because that was, to some degree, he was your hero. He was. He was. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. My yeah. father was, and and I mean, such a great man, humble man, hardworking man. In spite of you know the lack of education that he, he you know he had, um, he was a brilliant man, mm. brilliant man. He just didn't have the opportunities to do great things in life. But I mean, the character that he had to me was great enough. Can I correct you on that one? No, he yes, did, did the great thing in life. He raised two exceptional sons. Oh, thank you. He thank you. to exceptional sons. So you. you have people that have a lot of letters behind their name, but they're horrible right. parents. Right. right. So right. the greatest, his greatest accomplishment were the raising of his two sons to where right. he got to see their success. Yes, yes, yes. So that, that I, I just wanted to make sure I corrected that with you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, thank you um, but before we close this interview, I just want to, um, have people know a little bit more personally about you. You are married, obviously. I am married, yes. Yes, yes. and uh, to the, I believe, Jelene? Jelene Altino, yes. yes. Yes, yes. And you guys have been married for how long? We've been married uh, almost eight years. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah. So um, anything else in terms of uh, any children or anything like that? Yeah, or, I have two yeah. Grown daughters. Awesome. Two grown daughters, they're doing very well. One is in college. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, the person with medicine, mm -hmm. and then one is um, a life coach and a nurse. Awesome. Yeah. The legacy of education continues. Yes, indeed. Absolutely, indeed. absolutely. So now as we are closing this interview, um, how can people contact you um, mm -hmm. So on social media? They could like our page, uh, the Altino Brothers Facebook page. We're also on Instagram. Um, also, our website, www.thealtinobrothers.com. So uh, for any bookings and so forth, they could go to the website and, and, we'll, and we'll make sure that someone gets the message to us. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I once again, Nerva Maestro, Nerva Altino, thank mm -hmm. you so much for being here on the show and sharing a little bit of your story. But there is thank so you. much more to his story from his book, More Than a Gift. So please support this get the book, it will not only be, a, it will just bless your heart and also make it a gift for somebody else. They will definitely, definitely be uh, blessed by it as well. So once again, once again, Indigo Worship is doing our virtual music conference on April the 25th. And if you want more information about that and registering for that, you would just go to shopindigo.com. That's shopindigo.com for more information. So we wanna thank you very much for being a part of the show and follow this wonderful, wonderful master musician, ma maestro Nerva Altino, and follow us here on Facebook, here at Indigo Worship Live Show, and on Instagram at Official Indigo Worship. And to everyone that's watching tonight, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for allowing us to take a little bit of time out of your evening, and from Nerva and myself. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>